The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. It's back. The kind of big government that introduced massive programs during the Great Depression and in the post-World War II era has been welcomed by citizens and politicians of all stripes in this pandemic emergency. Tonight, we'll weigh the pros and cons and consider if it's here to stay. Then we'll find out why research scientist and author Mark Posnansky is downright optimistic about the ability of science to solve some of the biggest problems facing humanity today and tomorrow. It's Thursday, May 20th, and that's ahead on the agenda. For a few decades there, at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st, politicians across the political spectrum saw reducing the role of government as a top priority. Then came COVID-19, and suddenly the role of government seemed pretty vital once more, and with it, unprecedented spending. With us on the significance of that return to big government, we welcome in Lorignal in Eastern Ontario, Sean Spear, fellow in residence at the Public Policy Forum. In the nation's capital, Angela McEwen, senior economist with CUPE National, that's the Canadian Union of Public Employees. She's also co-author of the forthcoming book, Share the Wealth, how we can tax Canada's super rich and create a better country for everyone. And in Apsley, Ontario, that's in North Kawartha, Tasha Kiridan, a principal at the strategy and public affairs firm, Navigator. And it's great to welcome you three back onto our airwaves again here on TVO. I want to start with an excerpt of something Sean wrote a month ago in his new website called The Hub. So here goes. Yesterday's federal budget, along with the Biden administration's activist ambitions in the United States, signals the rise of a new confident progressivism that has set its sights on the commanding heights of policy and governance. It mostly rejects concerns about the disincentives of high rates of taxation, the economic costs of deficits and debt, or the limits of state action. Instead, it advances a governing vision rooted in the idea that inclusion and equity are not only greater priorities than economic efficiency, but are actually themselves drivers of growth and long-term value. This is a far cry from the limited ambitions of Blairism, Clintonism, or what the Fraser Institute has described as the Chrétien consensus. Okay, Sean, let's get into this, shall we? Was the $650 billion federal budget uh, the death knell of the old low-tax, smaller government approach in Canada? I, I, think, it, I think it represents a, a paradigmatic moment, Steve. Um, uh, you know, the origins of that uh, piece that you that you referenced uh, will be familiar to you as a journalist. I was sitting at my desk on the night of the budget thinking what I was going to say. Um, you know, part of my job is commenting on these types of things. And there was already uh, a flurry of analysis about the size of the deficit, um, you know, some of the different programs and that were being advanced and the kind of level of ambition represented in the Trudeau government. Um, and I saw a tweet from a progressive economist named Rob Gillizo at the University of Victoria, where he, in which he described uh, the budget as the culmination of a, a, a lengthy process of ideation um, on the part of progressive thinkers and writers and scholars. Um, and that gave me um, you know, the basis to write the piece that, that you referenced, the idea that um, the budget isn't just a political document, it represents a, a significant moment um, in the world of political ideas and, you know, the rise, I think, of a, a new confident progressivism, um, you know, that, that is challenging um, the consensus around economic policy making uh, that uh, has shaped a kind of bipartisan approach in Canada and indeed across the Anglosphere. Tasha, how about it? Has everybody lost Milton Friedman's phone number these days? <laughs> Um, I think to an extent, yes, I will not disagree with Sean that uh, you're seeing a sea change. You're seeing um, definitely a movement towards greater government at the moment. And it's not surprising. It's, it's not simply the pandemic, but the pandemic, I think, accounts for a lot of it because in a moment of crisis, the government has been the place where people have been able to turn. Um, I do think, though, this budget here is also an election budget. Let's be realistic. It has something for everything, everyone in it. 
uh, because we're going to head into an election cycle. And it wouldn't have been this big if we didn't have COVID. Uh, the, the liberals are big spenders, but not as big as this. That said, I do think that we're at this sort of moment where, yes, uh, people are expecting more from their government. At the same time, I think governments won't be able to deliver that uh, over the longer term because they will go broke uh, if they try. And we've seen this movie before. If government tries to do everything, it uh, ends up in a situation where it would have to raise taxes to such a rate that the economy would suffer greatly. So I think that this is part of a cycle, but I don't think that it is, it's gonna be around forever. And I think there are other alternatives to fill gaps in spending, uh, including the private sector, which I know we're gonna get into later in the show. Indeed, we shall uh, pursue those issues as we go along. Angela, let me though pick up on the, uh, on the pandemic angle here and ask you whether or not you think it took a pandemic for the Liberal government to feel that it had adequate support to be as interventionist in the economy as it has been. That's a tricky question. So I don't feel that the Trudeau government has been incredibly interventionist in the economy. They've handed out money uh, through CERB directly to people. And they were really, that was one of their only options because the tools of the federal government had atrophied to such an extent that they were really only able to get money out to people um, through the Canada Revenue Agency. The uh, employment insurance system wasn't working because it has been atrophied over decades. Uh, and there, there weren't a lot of other options. They didn't have the levers that they needed in place. Those were gone. And so they've, they've used some shortcuts. They've uh, given more money out to businesses through, say, the, the wage subsidy. And we've seen how terribly that went uh, because they, did, they didn't um, put any restrictions on it. So companies that were profitable, that were paying out dividends to shareholders, that were taking huge executive salaries um, that were actually, uh, you know, firing workers or um, locking them out and using replacement workers got this public money. And so I wouldn't say it's been an incredibly interventionist uh, government in the way that I would like it to be <laughs> or the way okay. that John is talking about the progressive movement would like it to be. Uh, all right, I understand. Let me do a follow up with you then and, and put it this way. What are the problems that you think government and only government can solve in 2021 that you think no other sector in society can? Absolutely. So I think the care economy is a big piece of that. And so that is something that we saw in the budget. We saw a move towards actually implementing a national child care system. Um, there is no there should be no profit motive in care. We saw that in long-term care, that the profit motive resulted in more deaths, that it results in um, worse working conditions for workers, which absolutely then ends up in worse, worse conditions for the people who are being cared for. So in terms of long-term care, in terms of even just testing people for the virus or rolling out the vaccine or developing um, the vaccine, I think we would have been much farther ahead if we still had the public institutions like pharmaceutical research that we had in the 80s that Brian Mulroney privatized. If we had public long-term care, um, like most of the, the long-term care homes in Saskatchewan where I grew up were long-term care and they've been privatized and they've been focusing on building um, the, this sort of private model that really doesn't work to deliver care. And so if we want to have an economy that is strong, that is prosperous, that we take care of each other, I think the government has to really focus on infrastructure, like broadband internet. We've seen this, <laughs> where that's absolutely critical to participate in this economy. Um, and they've delivered that through privatizing again. They've delivered subsidies to private companies that then charge huge um, bills to private citizens. And so that excludes people from the economy. That excludes people from being able to participate in the economy in a way that is not healthy for any of us. And so well, those two pieces, uh -huh. care, and key infrastructure. Understood. Uh, Sean, if, if we think the numbers are big here, let's look stateside because the Biden administration is spending uh, not hundreds of billions as we are here, but trillions to bring the economy back from COVID-19. And I wonder to the extent that anything is permanent in this world, do you think this is ushering in a new era of, you know, semi-permanent big spending? Yeah, that, that's the risk, as Milton Friedman famously said, there's, there's nothing permanent, nothing more permanent than a temporary government program. Um, <laughs> but if, if I can just step back for a second, Tasha talked about the kind of secular nature of the 
of the world of political ideas. Uh, we saw, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the, the rise of Reagan and Thatcher um, in the late 70s and early 80s in response to a series of, of significant challenges facing advanced economies. We had stagnation, sclerosis, and drift, you know, captured most poignantly by Jimmy Carter's uh, crisis of confidence speech. And, and so they ushered in an era of market reforms to unshackle the economy, and that produced a whole host of benefits in the form of lifting billions of people out of poverty around the world, ushering in uh, the computer revolution, um, and, and so on. Um, you know, but I think what we've seen uh, it, over the past decade or so um, is diminished returns in terms of the, the kind of implementation of policies um, influenced and shaped by those ideas. And I think the global financial crisis in a lot of ways, Steve, was an inflection point. You know, it might have represented in hindsight uh, a kind of expiry date uh, for what is sometimes referred to as the, a neoliberal consensus or the Washington consensus or however one might describe it. Um, and I think what we've only seen more and more, particularly in the context of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, is the emergence of alternative uh, ways of thinking. Tasha, as you look south, what concerns you? Um, I'm concerned more about the social stability or instability in the United States. I think that um, both my fellow panelists mentioned inequality. Inequality is a big issue now across the board. Um, it is up there with the environment. People are, there's a, a sort of a, a, a sense of consciousness or awakening um, following the death of George Floyd, uh, following the Black Lives Matter movement, but also I think also the sense that that's coming out of the financial crisis, as Sean mentioned, that was a sort of economic inequality piece. And now you're seeing the social inequality piece. And I think the United States in particular has to grapple with its historical legacy on slavery in a way that um, most other nations do not, but other nations also still have high levels of inequality and discrimination. So that's what concerns me most south of the border. Um, I think the spending piece, of course, the runaway train on spending, um, you know, we're seeing it, like you said, around the world. I don't think that is sustainable. I do think though that inequality is something that will be a driving force politically. And that is where government does have a different role in, in the sense that yes, it tries to level the playing field, but I think ultimately the playing field will be leveled more by the private sector, by corporations than by government. They are the employers of record. They are the people who are responding to consumers. They are seeing increasing demands by both their workforce and customers and the general public to step up on issues, for example, of inequality and also to pay fairer wages to, we saw that during the pandemic, pay a premium to essential workers. Uh, companies that did those sorts of things did very well in the public eye and they realized also that it also improves shareholder returns. So I think, you know, to go back to the question of what's going to motivate people um, to change, yes, government can use the stick and say, we're going to force people to change. I think ultimately, public pressure and these waves, this movement, as Sean said, the wave that's coming now is going to make change happen where it will perhaps be more lasting. And that is in the private sector and with uh, different types of behavior from companies. Angela, I got a feeling you want to take that on. Right. So I think the role of government here is actually to make the rules fair. And what has happened over the past few decades is the system has become rigged because the people who have power are these super large corporations. So we saw Amazon, for example, who isn't paying its workers uh, a bonus, who is didn't even give workers sick leave, who had huge outbreaks in their uh, warehouses, and the government had to step in and shut it down. Um, and it was, it was actually like the local health district that had to come in and sit, shut it down in Peel because the government wasn't willing, the provincial government wasn't willing to take action. And it was racialized workers mostly who were at risk. So I would say that the people who have been most targeted by the, the negative inequality impacts of this recession don't have the power in the system right now and the rules aren't fair. That's why when we have the wage subsidy paid out to people that pay these dividends, because the government didn't make the rules of the game fair. And that is a key problem. And it's too technical and it's too easy to spin for there to actually develop a sustained public pressure to change the system. We tend to see historically these waves. Inequality has to get pretty bad for there to be this public pressure 
to shift and to force government to step in and play its role as defender of citizens instead of as defender of profit for corporations. Uh, Sean, given, I, I'm not sure whose dog we're hearing in the background, but uh, <laughs> all pets like to make cameos during this program we've discovered over the last year and a half. Uh, the dog sounds in misery, which sounds like a good time to raise the issue of the misery index. Uh, for those who are young and may not remember, uh, we do remember, you referenced it a moment ago, the, the economic difficulties during the time of Jimmy Carter and then Ronald Reagan, George Bush, the father, coming into power after that. And, and the thing called the misery index, which was something that was uh, very helpful to Ronald Reagan's campaign. Uh, we actually have a chart with this. Do you want to walk us through this and explain what the misery index is and what this chart shows? Sure. Uh, thanks, Steve. I, I referenced earlier that, um, that the, the rise of the, the kind of market-oriented consensus of the late 70s uh, you know, can find its origins in this chart. Um, you know, there was a, a sense by the end of the 70s um, that the mixed economy model, which envisioned the kind of role for government in shaping market outcomes that Angela is referring to, um, had kind of end, reached its end. Um, and the, the fact that uh, the American economy was marked by a combination of high unemployment and high inflation, uh, which, uh, which were represented in this misery index um, that spiked to unprecedented rates uh, in the late 70s was a sign um, that new ideas, new approaches needed to take shape. And, and that uh, ultimately, um, as you said, Steve, became you know, a, a major part of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher's value proposition. And yeah, let know, me just ask the, Tony, I guess that, forgive me for a sec, Sean. I'm gonna ask Tony to bring the chart up again because the misery index was basically take the inflation rate, take the unemployment rate, add them together. Uh, obviously you'd love that line to be right near the bottom, right? Low unemployment, low inflation. And we, you can see the spikes on this chart here, uh, particularly around 1980 when um, <laughs> the misery index was extremely high and ushered in uh, Reaganomics. Uh, anyway, sorry to interrupt there, Sean, but I, I wanted people to understand what that chart was saying. Take it away. So I guess there's a bit of a lesson there, Steve. You know, um, Angela has described a, a kind of heightened ambition for the role of government um, uh, going forward. And I, I think, you know, if progressives are uh, prepared to take some advice from a uh, conservative, uh, I would say, you know, you need to be careful. Um, the risk of overreach, um, which we saw in the late 70s, um, precipitated the kind of course correction represented by Reagan and Thatcher. And so, you know, on one hand, uh, while I'm anxious about um, some of these intellectual and policy developments, I'm, I'm, I remain kind of reasonably confident um, that, 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 that overreach uh, will necessitate the type of adjustments that I suspect Tash and I would be more predisposed to. But let me just make one final point. In that regard, there's an onus on conservatives uh, to develop an agenda that is responsive to the issues and challenges facing mm -hmm. Canada uh, in, in 2021. You know, one of the reasons why this market-oriented consensus ultimately, um, it, you know, lost its salience was because it seemed um, like it, it became dogmatic. You know, that is to say, it continued to advance the same ideas, same policies, even though the circumstances and conditions were different than the ones in which it, it was initially conceived. And, you know, I think in some ways, um, the onus is on conservatives here. Um, you know, they became too persuaded by the end of history narrative um, and lost their uh, connection um, to the issues and challenges facing ordinary people. And, you know, the consequence is, um, you know, the, the growing resonance of uh, progressive ideas. Let me ask Angela if she's prepared to accept your advice about overreach <laughs> and the admonitions that come along with that. What about it, Angela? So what I'm more worried about is actually uh, co-opting of some of our ideas and that um, because what we're looking for isn't just higher taxes and more government spending. There are different choices that we want to make. We want to invest differently than we did before. And so some of that might seem familiar, a national transit. So I want a crown corporation that will affordably help people get across this giant country that we have. It seems ridiculous that you can't get from A to B um, without a car in lots of places in Canada, right? So, and with Greyhound going bankrupt, we know that that's not profitable. So there are things that the public needs that aren't exactly public goods the way economists mm -hmm. think of them, but are good for the public. 
and uh, that I think there is a government role in, in doing that. But that doesn't mean that I think the government should take over every private um, role. I think there is that we really have to have a good conversation about the role between government and the private sector and the way that government can enhance what the private sector does. All businesses would benefit if we had, for example, affordable uh, telecommunications infrastructure in Canada, rather than a system where we give handouts to specific businesses that know how to use the government grant system. I don't think that's a, an indication of success in the economy. I think that what we want to do is provide that foundation for all uh, businesses and people to succeed. I think we want to make the rules. Oh, I think we lost Angela. That this is uh, one of the reactions. It's ironic. She's talking about broadband and telecommunication services and <laughs> yeah, bingo. There we go. <laughs> we, we will get her hooked back into this in a second. But, but Tasha, you mentioned something a moment ago that I wanted to follow up on, and that was the sustainability of the current amount of funding that governments in the West, uh, well, all over the world seem prepared to do right now. And, and I want to flip that around and ask you the other side of that coin, which is, you know, by the... Oh, I don't know. I guess by the middle 2000s, two, uh, two, 2010s, whatever those are called, I guess by around the, by the time Dalton McGinty and, and Stephen Harper had left office, the push to lower corporate income taxes in the hopes that they would use that added revenue to hire people uh, really had become religion for many on the right. And I wonder whether given the demands on the public purse today for additional spending for a lot of the things that we just heard Angela talking about, do you think the low levels of corporate tax rates in this country, do you think that was sustainable as well? Um, I think yeah, to short answer is I think yes. And I'll tell you why I don't think that, um, high rates of corporate taxation are going to yield longer revenues for the government in the long term. It's, it's very clear when you look at historical levels of taxation, you reach a tipping point on the curve where it actually brings in less government revenue, in part because um, companies will also move the seats. Now they have greater mobility. They'll move the seats of their corporations elsewhere. They will find ways of not paying those high taxes. They'll get out of your jurisdiction. They won't set up a plant there, or they'll simply have their head office somewhere else. So you're, you're dealing in an era right now and you have great mobility uh, for corporations and corporate money. You also, though, interestingly, what the pandemic has shown us um, is that you also have a greater now um, ability of individuals to have this mobility to work from anywhere. Um, as you said, I'm sitting here in my kitchen in Apsley in uh, North Kawartha. I can work from here. Um, I am lucky I can do that, but I'm not alone. I mean, a lot of people can work from different places. This is also going to change the relationship on a lot of levels of government to individuals and to corporations. Corporations are going to have to make a greater incentive to keep workers because workers now don't have to move for their job. They could move from their home. They can stay where they are and take another job much more easily than they could in the past. Um, also, governments, though, are going to be, I think, having to reprioritize. I disagree. We need a, a, a national transit strategy. I think that it's great that people actually, many people are no longer taking transit or the car to work. That is something that maybe a benefit that comes out of this if work from home becomes a greater reality for more people. There are communities in Ontario that have used, for example, small scale transit services based on the Uber model that are much more efficient, much less costly to the public purse than some giant, you know, usual, we think of have a bus route that runs 24 hours. Uh, it doesn't make sense. We have to think outside the box. So if, if government just goes in and says, yes, let's splash out on a national transit study because we think people should get from A to B without a car. Well, not all of Canada is like that. You're never going to have transit in North Kawartha, for example, from where I'm sitting to, to other places um, that runs on the schedule that you would see in an urban center. We have to be more diverse in our approaches. So I'm hoping that the spending that is happening while it's, you know, while it goes on, which frankly, it can't go on forever, um, that it is actually deployed into places that make sense, that make change that actually will be beneficial that takes into the into account the realities that that we that we now have. This is not the model of even 2000 or 2010. Steve, um, you know, one of the areas where I do think there there needs to be adjustments or corrections to the to the market oriented consensus that predated, um, uh, you know, the pandemic um, is in the area of uh, domestic productive capacities. You know, one of the consequences of um, the emphasis on globalization and letting markets determine 
um, you know, where things were made um, and who made them, I think is we've, we've discovered in the context of the pandemic um, that there are a number of kind of critical um, productive capacities that we don't have in our jurisdiction and, and many countries like us have, have d discovered the same thing. I, I do think one of the uh, outcomes of the pandemic that ought to be the subject of a kind of left-right consensus is the need to rethink um, the role of government in ensuring that there are certain kind of strategic capacities that we need to uh, have within our borders. And I, I think, you know, we'll see a move towards reshoring. And I, I don't think conservatives who are generally um, suspicious of government intervention should oppose those steps. I, I think you know we, we want to make sure in the next emergency um, we, we have the capacities we need. There, there will be an example of a more interventionist government um, that I would uh, that I would support. I notice now Angela is back, and Angela, there is something deeply ironic about you're trying to make a point about the unequal application of broadband across the country <laughs> at the moment <laughs> that that your line crashes. But anyway, we're glad to have you back, and and. I want to, um, just in our remaining moments here, I, I want to get us onto a bit of a conversation about, you know, we're borrowing massive amounts of money right now. I know, Angela, you believe that is it is sustainable, that uh, it is not, um, the government is not taking too big a part of the uh, economic uh, activity of this country. But, but we are borrowing hundreds of billions of dollars right now to do what we're doing. And I guess the question is, how do you think we are going to pay that back someday? Well, thank you very much, Steve. So I, I do think that we can borrow money. Um, if you look at uh, government spending, we often think about the deficit, but we don't always factor in the benefit of that spending. And so as long as our the benefit of what we're spending on has a higher rate of return than the cost of carrying that debt, uh, we're okay. I'm, you could run deficits forever. My husband doesn't believe me. People, this is not <laughs> um, but but mathematically it works. But that's what we're doing right now. We have huge billions of dollars of deficit. You cannot do that indefinitely. I don't think. I think that the international market at some point punishes you and no longer offers you debt. Um, and and. We are right now mostly borrowing from ourselves, where most of the debt is is in Canadian dollars. Um, so as long as Canadians are willing to lend to the government, um, we're we're okay. But I do think in the in the medium term, in the longer term, we need to tax people more, and we have cut taxes by between fifty to seventy five billion dollars at the federal government level just since 2000. And so this has been part of uh, Jean Chrétien's uh, government, uh, Paul Martin, uh, Stephen Harper, and, and Justin Trudeau has mostly not cut taxes. Um, he's raised some a little, he's cut some a little, uh, but the middle class tax cut that really only went to the top 10% of income earners is, is $6 billion that, that revenue. The way we tax gains cuts about $20 billion out of revenue. The corporate income tax rate fell from 30% to 15% now. And globally, we've seen that, that that orthodoxy that Sean's talking about, cutting corporate taxes no longer conveys any economic benefit. All it does is increase um, actually inequality. It increases the money going to the top 1%. That's what research has shown us. And so my colleague and I, who really think that we need to kind of rebalance things, that this, this pendulum has gone way too far, we need to increase government revenue. We wrote the book called Share the Wealth, where we list several key ways that we can increase taxes. And oh dear, here we go again. Can I jump uh, in? Yeah, Tashi, you looked like you were champing at the bit to get in there anyway, so go ahead. A little bit. Um, I was gonna say, um, yes, and we also have, I, I, don't, I don't disagree that there have been tax cuts, but I also uh, would like to point out we have prior to the pandemic anyway, as a result of this, uh, historically low levels of unemployment in this country. We have historically low levels of inflation, and it's fine to say you can rack up debt as long as you also have historically low interest rates. That's one of the reasons that individuals as well have been borrowing as much as they have. You jack those up and you get back to the situation in the 1980s when you did have 18% interest rates. Um, you know, it was not uncommon to have that uh, on a mortgage and people were not able to buy a home. People complain today they can't buy a home. Well, good luck with that. 
Um, Argentina comes to mind, a country that racks up debt endlessly. That's what you get. Newfoundland right now is facing a debt and spending crisis within our own borders. Um, and, you know, it's, it's fine to say, well, we'll tax people more. You can't simply say we will tax corporations, tax individuals. The money will not necessarily stay in your country. You will also um, unbalance a system whereby if you do tax, if you do increase taxes, you shouldn't be doing it on income. This is the other fallacy is that, you know, we've, we've decreased income taxes and, and somehow that's deprived the government of revenue. Well, the GST uh, or HST uh, in some provinces is ticking along very well. No one's getting rid of that uh, because it is bringing in billions of dollars over time since it was brought in. Um, that it was not necessarily anticipated to do. That's the cash cow for this government. So there are lots of taxes flowing to the government. The problem is, as Sean said, the more you give them or the more programs you start, um, the more taxes you need to feed them and they will not go away. So you have to be very judicious about any new programs that you do start, which is why in particular this, this budget to me is upsetting or disturbing because it is spending more on new programs at a time when we are in a crisis situation borrowing just to keep the economy afloat. So I think we have to be very careful about overextending ourselves because other countries and history has shown us that can really prove to be disastrous. Tasha, I'm going to give you the last 30 seconds in our program here today for a couple of reasons. Number one, I want to know your answer to the question. Number two, both of our other two guests have disappeared because oh, of no. broadband, broadband problems. So oh. uh, in any event, let's let's just finish up on this. You know, I, we, we famously remember Prime Minister uh, Trudeau saying that we can essentially grow our way out of deficits. And I know he was ridiculed for saying that, but there is a school of thought that says if the government invests in things that are smart and, and not just throwing money away willy nilly, but actually invests in things that are smart and can grow the economy to the point where the money we owe is a smaller percentage of our gross domestic product we can get there, can we not? I mean, would you grant that, that, that there is some credibility in that? That's assuming their investments are wisely made. So this right. is the issue. Um, market investments, investments made by companies, they will uh, expect a return. They will not invest in something unless they believe they will get that return and they can basically show their shareholders, yes, you should invest in this. Government uh, is voted in by voters and it makes its priorities on basis on politics too. I mean, think of all, I think I, I'm from Quebec originally and the joke there was in the time of Maurice Duplessis, you know, you voted Union Nationale, you had a road in your riding. This kind of thing, these decisions, it's fine to say, let's build road, let's build transit, uh, let's build these things. But if you're not making them for, just as you point out, economic decisions or economic reasons, then you're not going to get the bang for your buck. Um, you're going to get also people applying for all those grant programs that were mentioned earlier if you create grant programs preferential treatment to some not to others so again the less you're 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 outlaying to begin with the less risk of that i think certain things like broadband i do think yes i will say i think broadband should be extended because it will give people the options and more choices of where they live and it will improve um, not just the ability of your guests to enter into this program steve and participate <laughs> um, but it will also improve our connectivity which will help lift people out of poverty in remote communities so i think that is that is as an investment i would actually agree with our other guests should be made. i i'm all for increased uh, connectivity <laughs> particularly during current affairs programs where it seems to be an issue but actually i think we, <laughs> i think we have everybody lined up just long enough to say sean spear from the public policy forum Angela McEwen from QP National, Tasha Kiridan from Navigator. Thanks everybody for being here for most of our conversation. We've enjoyed it very much. Take care, everybody. The first line of Mark Poznanski's new book is rather ominous. He writes, the future of mankind is far from secure. But over the next 200 pages, Poznanski can get you downright giddy at the prospects of scientific advancement saving our world in so many ways. His book, perhaps appropriately, is called Saved by Science, The Hope and Promise of Synthetic Biology. And it brings the former scientific director of the Robarts Research Institute to our airwaves from the Forest Hill area of the provincial capital. Dr. Poznanski, it's good to see you again. How are you managing? I'm doing well. Thank Good. you. Glad to hear it. I, let, let's start with this kind of quirky question. How bad did things have to get before you could finally feel the need to write a, a fairly optimistic book about our future? Well, uh, it started with synthetic, start to understand a little bit about synthetic biology 
But then I, I must have gone through a pretty pessimistic uh, mood, especially at the start of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I, I started to think about it, just how di what dire straits we're really in, in in terms of our health, looking at not only infectious diseases, but many cancers that, that have been resolved, uh, all of the mental illnesses that, we, that we've done very poorly with. And then I started to look at other areas, uh, the security of our food supply, not so much in Toronto, but worldwide. And uh, is there going to be enough food in, in, uh, in 20, 2050? And then finally, I got to thinking more about climate change and global warming and where we're going there and uh, became very pessimistic. And then started seeing some incredibly exciting solutions uh, through science. Synthetic biology is only one area. And I thought that it's important for for the peop people, non-scientists, to know that there are problems and there are solutions. Well, let's pull a, a quote out of the book, shall we? Because here you've got Steve Jobs quoted in your book as saying, I think the biggest innovations of the 21st century will be at the intersection of biology and technology. And you just referred to that. You call it synthetic biology. Why don't you tell us what that is? So Steve Jobs was a super techie, but he didn't know a ton of, of, about biology. But somehow he was able to predict that the 21st century will, in fact, be uh, uh, have incredible developments as a result of in, uh, knowledge in biology and, of course, the, the, the tech revolution. And uh, synthetic biology is a perfect example of that, uh, of that intersection. Uh, where we start to understand the biology of a whole range of different uh, species, from microbes all the way to man, where we can genetically sequence all of those organisms, that is, understand the blueprint of life for them, and then use the technology that Jobs talks about to actually create new, even new life forms or alter cells to correct them, uh, cancer cells that, that have uh, genetic mutations or uh, bacteria that are doing us harm. And I guess the best example is the mRNA vaccine that was uh, developed for COVID-19 in record speed. And that's a very good example of synthetic biology. Well, you gave us a hint of this a moment ago where you essentially told us the, the different areas that your book looks at uh, in terms of where you think science can save us. And I just want to focus on a few of those areas. We're going to talk health, we're going to talk food, and we're going to talk pollution. So let's start with health. And here's this quote from your book. Estimates are that within three to five years, 90% of the population will suffer from any number of severe, usually fatal outcomes. But stored in our computers is the entire genome sequences of a bacterium that is completely resistant to ionizing radiation. Can you pick up the story from, where, from there? What do you imagine could emerge from that bacterium? So that's fanciful, but it's exciting because it's possible. So say, God forbid, uh, the ozone layer is destroyed for whatever, re for whatever reason. We would all start to suffer from ionizing radiation, bad skin cancer uh, and other uh, melanomas. Uh, and there might actually be a solution because there are microbes that have through evolution, a billion years of evolution, have developed ways to protect themselves against ionizing radiation. And that is they've developed uh, uh, repair mechanisms for genetic defects that occur as a result of the, uh, of the radiation. Now, if we know the gene that's helping the microbe to survive the radiation, we could possibly take that gene and insert it into our own cells and make ourselves resistant to that same ionizing radiation. That occurs simply because microbes have had three billion years of evolution to solve these problems, and uh, modern man has only been around for 300,000 years. So we don't have any of, those, any of those mechanisms. So they've had a bit of a head start on us to figure this out. That's right. Okay, let's do some more on health. Uh, I'm gonna bring up a couple of charts here, one at a time. And this is a chart that compares a number of fatal health circumstances from the year 1960 until 2012. And if we look at the numbers of people that have died from heart disease today as compared to then, 60 years ago, it's down 68%. P 
people who die from pneumonia today versus 60 years ago, off 70%. Stomach cancer, down 70%. Stroke, down 70%. Smallpox, eradicated. We have no people dying of smallpox anymore. What have we apparently figured out about these conditions, Dr. Poznanski, that has led to such success? Well, in each case, we, we, we know specifically in the case of heart disease and stroke, we've understood the, the, the relationship between, uh, largely between blood pressure and those situations. We've uh, d developed uh, techniques to lower cholesterol levels. We've, uh, we've, we, we know when a heart attack uh, occurs and we know what to do with the patient. And we all have all sorts of surgery, stents, bypass surgery, et cetera. In the case of stomach cancer, we know how to detect it early, and uh, there are drugs that help us with it. And of course, uh, smallpox is a, a vaccine that has wiped it out entirely. Well, let's try this. How optimistic are you that we are actually headed for a world where, where we can turn on a dime and leave a nickel change when it comes to dealing with a virus and coming up with a vaccine within days or months as opposed to years? Well, we, we, we just showed that, okay? Uh, we, we, uh, uh, the, the new technology of mRNA vaccine traditionally should have taken uh, 10 or 15 years to develop and to test. And with COVID-19, we did, we did the whole thing in well under a year. Uh, Moderna, the, the, the company making the, the, one of the mRNA drugs, uh, is tweaking the vaccine for the new variants of the disease, and those are going to be, uh, be tested clinically within days, not months and years. So really, the COVID-19 experience is uh, a demonstration of how quickly we can, we can do things. And in the years to come, it'll be even faster because you, you, you isolate the, the, the virus, uh, you uh, sequence it, and that used to take billions of dollars in a few years. Now it can be done in 10 or 20 minutes with, uh, with, uh, with $100. And so you can determine what the, what the mutation is very rapidly and uh, do, design uh, an mRNA in this case, uh, uh, drug right on your computer and then send it to the lab to be uh, produced. Hmm. All right, let's move from health to hunger. I want to talk food because you talk about growing a new form of lettuce, for example, with 50% less sunlight and 75% less water than is required today. What's the idea there? Well, again, you come you come back to 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 the fact that, that there are a ton of different microbes that have adapted to different conditions uh, in the world, and you you know what those conditions are, and you know what the genomics, you know what genes are associated with it, at that adaptation, and uh, you can use them uh, to modify your food. So let's take an example of a rice farmer in India. And all of his land becomes uh, uh, contaminated with sea salt from a monsoon. Well, he can either close up shop uh, or he can try uh, to do something to allow his rice to grow in salty water. Well, it turns out that there are genes which will which allow plants to grow in salty wa water. We can take those genes, we can know what they are very quickly, and we can insert them into the rice genome and put that rice farmer back back into business. So, in the case of lettuce, you have a, you have a vegetable or with, with with very little nutritional value, and but you have a, the ability to grow it in a lot of sunlight. Uh, so, why not enhance? The, uh, the lettuce with, with, with protein by inserting a, a, a gene for protein into the lettuce genome. And now you have a, uh, a, a, a vegetable lettuce with, with high nutritional value. And you can do that with, with whatever you like. I mean, you can, you can make a carrot with a protein or you can, make, uh, uh, you can make a potato that can grow in colder conditions and grow it further north. Or you can even take wheat and grow it either further north or further south, uh, depending on the, the uh, conditions you have. Uh, or you can actually have a, a vegetable whose genome sits on your computer, and when you go to Mars, you simply take that, that genome on your computer and you grow a completely new vegetable or completely new fruit dependent on the growth conditions on Mars, light, heat, <laughs> Etc. 
I mean, the implications of this are absolutely astonishing. And I, I want to throw a quote your way from Craig Venter, who was the first man to um, map the human genome. You've got him in your book. He says, agriculture as we know it needs to disappear, that we can design better and healthier proteins than we get from nature. You think that's possible? Oh, it, 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 it's not only possible, it's necessary because uh, unfortunately the entire agricultural area is very energy dependent and it's a huge user of fossil fuels and a huge uh, uh, warmer of the climate in terms of CO2, greenhouse gases. And so I believe that uh, as we go to feed the world in, tw in 2050, we're gonna, we're gonna have to use much less land, we're have to, gonna have to clear fewer forests, and we'll actually have uh, food grown in, uh, in, uh, in large vats in laboratories. And it'll be real food, it won't be fake food. <laughs> uh, and there's an Israeli group that's producing super meat, meat in, in large vats, uh, so rather than growing the meat on the back of an animal, a chicken or, you know, whatever, you can grow it in large vats. And then if you want, if you insist on having your meat look like a, a porterhouse steak, you can simply use a, uh, a digital printer to make hmm. it look like a porterhouse steak. Now, this is not fanciful. You can already buy ice cream uh, in California and end up from a different number of different companies where the milk used to make the ice cream is grown in large vats of yeast. So all the proteins that are cur that are currently made in milk in a cow can be made in a vat of of uh, of any bacteria, but specifically they're using yeast right now. And and those ice cream cones and and creams and milks are available uh, at, at the market in San Francisco. Huh. All right, we've talked healthcare, we've talked food, and let's talk about the third thing that I uh, said we'd touch on at the beginning, and that's pollution. Pollution reduction. You refer to a microbe that will help remove mercury and lead from our lakes and rivers. What's that about? So let's go back 2,500 years, okay? And it's written that the uh, copper miners in Spain would take... Uh, water from the Rio Tinto River, that's a red river, and pour it over their copper deposits. And this would allow them to uh, extract the carp copper from the copper sulfate. So they didn't know what was going on. They had no idea what, what, what was in the water that was causing this. It turns out it's a bacteria that's in the water that derives its energy for living from b breaking down the bond between copper and sulfate. So here's a bacteria that specifically eats copper sulfate and spits out the copper. That's 2,500 years ago. So m more recently, uh, miners... In, uh, in, in Western Canada, the United States, and in Chile have discovered microbes that have specific, specific affinities uh, for, different, for, 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 different, uh, for different elements, specifically mercury and lead. So it's not far-fetched to start thinking that we can use large nets containing these microbes uh, to clean our rivers and, and, and lakes of molecules like, like lead and mercury. All right, let me ask you about another pollution problem. We know plastic takes years and years and years to break down, and it gets in our waterways, and it's incredibly harmful for that reason. It's essentially there forever. You talk about something that could actually break down the plastics in our oceans. What's that about? So uh, chemists have been surprisingly good at developing plastic material uh, that unfortunately do not uh, degrade. There are some plastics uh, that are de uh, that degrade by uh, with sunlight, but it's still pretty slow. And a group of Japanese have uh, recently developed again three different types of microbes that can uh, degrade plastic uh, to uh, water and uh, and carbon dioxide. And so that's tremendously exciting. It's being tested in, in, in Japan. Uh, it'll be an issue of how much the plastic costs to produce, but I, I have great hope that 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 will occur in the in you no know, within the few years to come and, and so we won't have those landfills and oceans filled with uh, filled with plastic. Okay, let's talk ethics here, because whenever science comes up with something new, uh, automatically, it seems, 
come a whole host of ethical questions that come alongside. Are there things related to the things that we've been talking about here tonight that require deeper, more ethical considerations? They all require ethical considerations. They all require regulatory issues. Uh, we have to make sure that everything we do as a result of the science is safe, okay? But we also have to do it not necessarily quickly, but we have to we have to be cognizant of the time we have to solve some of these problems. And we can't afford to let uh, some of these issues languish in academic ethics committees or government ethics committees uh, until most of the damage has, has been done. So ethics and regulation are very important, but we have to do them efficiently. And I have a, 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 a saying that I often use is that technology leapfrogs policy. And that's not good, okay? But it'll always happen if our regulatory bodies and our ethics bodies are, uh, are, are, are too slow. But do I hear you saying that we may have to, because of the time pressures, cut corners on ethical considerations or regulatory considerations in a way that we might not have 50 years ago because we just don't have the luxury of time to figure all this out? Well, there's a difference between cutting corners and being efficient. Hmm. Uh, so I, I do not accept the notion that we have to... Uh, that we have to cut corners. Uh, but uh, if we're going to approve a COVID-19 vaccine, uh, uh, people should be working on the weekend and it shouldn't sit on somebody's desk uh, between Thursday and, 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 and Tuesday uh, just because, uh, uh, you know, they want to, uh, they don't want to be working at those days. So it's not an issue of cutting corners. It's an issue of being efficient. And do we have that efficiency working for us yet in your view uh, uh well i'm gonna be <laughs> i'm in trouble anyway so i'll continue not in canada uh the americans are pretty good at it uh but but not in canada and it's interesting to see that uh, each of the vaccines that were approved in the united states uh took an additional uh, week or 10 days or, or sometimes even more to be uh to be uh uh, to be approved by 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 Health Canada, uh, and it's probably that they don't they just don't have uh, the people working on the issues, and they're probably more cautious, et cetera. Canadian. Well, well, that's what they'd like to say. They say we're more cautious, and that's why it takes longer. But is it maybe because they don't work weekends and the Americans do? Well, I, I can tell you a, a, a personal experience of a, of a drug that uh, we developed at the Robarts about 20 years ago. And in parallel, I took it to the Food and Drug Administration in Washington and to Health uh, Canada uh, in, 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 in Ottawa. Uh, the people at the Food and Drug Administration held my hand and walked me through. I was a neophyte at the time, walked me through the process and helped me uh, tremendously, and the drug got tested through the Americans. I'm yet to, to uh, hear from uh, Health Canada 20 years later. Yeah, seriously? You haven't heard from them yet? Absolutely. Why do you think? Well, I don't, they just, I just they, they probably hoped that I had went, gone, gone away. <laughs> and yet here you are. Uh, I, I, you know, after reading the book, you, you, don't get mad at me for saying this, but, but some of this stuff seems so futuristic. It seems science fiction rather than science fact. Is that fair to say? No. And the best example is the COVID-19 uh, 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 vaccine, okay? In that book, it was written just before COVID-19, and I talked about the fact that you would be able to identify the uh, the uh, the virus and uh, develop a highly specific uh, uh, vaccine to it in a matter of, well, I said hours and days. It took a little longer than that, but that's an example. Absolutely, these are these are not issues born of science fiction. I got to ask. One of them. Not one of them. Okay. Uh, I got to ask you. You've dedicated this book to your grandchildren. How many grandkids you got? Well, I had five then. I have no. I had six then. I just got developed another one who I, who I haven't seen. <laughs> so you, where are you at six and a half right now or so? 
No, no, I have a seventh, but he was born uh, late December in, in Alberta, so I haven't seen him yet. Oh, okay, okay, very good. So seven grandkids. Anyway, you have said that your grandkids and their generation are going to need all of these technologies and more to live at the standards that many of us enjoy today in the year 2021. And I guess I want to know what odds do you give on that happening? Well, as you say, I'm, I'm, an, I'm, I'm an optimist, and I think there are real scientific solutions to all of our problems. But, you know, we're going to have to figure out this global warming thing sooner rather than later. But there are solutions. But there are also a ton of people who think that it's a hoax. But if we were to uh, apply all the resources that the American government is giving to COVID-19, that $8 trillion, okay, we could solve global warming. We can convert the entire North American fossil fuel economy to one based on solar energy and nuclear energy and, 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 and wind. So there are solutions, but we have to have the wherewithal to, to, to apply them in a timely fashion. And if we wait too long, we're going to continue to suffer the uh, polar vortices that Texas suffered and the incredible fires that you see in Australia, California, and, and, and Oregon. And we, I don't think we can afford to have that occur, occur for too much longer. The name of your book, Saved by Science, The Hope and Promise of Synthetic Biology. It's brought Mark J. Poznanski to our virtual studio tonight from Forest Hill in Toronto. It's great to see you again, and thanks for joining us. Likewise. Thanks a lot, Steve. And that is the agenda for Thursday, May the 20th, 2021. As we approach the first long weekend of the season, tomorrow, Nam Kiwanuka finds out how Niagara region's tourism and farm sectors are holding up through this pandemic. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. And now, we'll see you tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.